thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully it goes all right and this is unmuted. And, um, you know, I still hope this is interesting and that no one's, you know, steadily plateauing on Zoom burnout. But um, I am excited to share some of the work that we're doing um, in really new lab down at UC Irvine. This is us right here. Uh, and so, you know, I'll just get started, right? So the way that I have this talk outlined is that, you know, I really just want to provide sort of a rationale for why, you know, endocrinology can be studied in the context of population genetics. Um, and, and, you know, after providing this rationale, I want to give you an example of, can we pick up modes that we know whereby tissues communicate just by simple surveys of natural variation? And then, you know, I'll move on to sort of um, modifying these generalized approaches and, and highlight sort of a few examples for how we can pick up ways that, that one tissue talks to another tissue. And so, um, you know, the way that I have this talk outlined is, is more so, uh, you know, emphasizing the different modalities that we can use different um, approaches to investigate from a bioinformatics end. Um, but if anyone's interested in some of the, the molecular mechanisms for some of the proteins that we're working on, I'd be really excited to share, um, you know, separately. So, uh, so, so, you know, I, I mean, the, the sort of big picture thing here is, right, I, I think some of you know this, we're celebrating uh, 100 years of the discovery of insulin this year. And, um, you know, I put this slide from, a, I guess it's an older review right now from, from Ron Khan's lab. But I, I just want to highlight that, you know, it literally has taken 100 years of really elegant experimentation to define what's the mechanism that insulin acts on and how are these mechanisms perturbed in the context of insulin resistance. And so you know, we, we all know insulin right, um, has a diverse set of functions across different tissues. This is context dependent. And you know, even its regulation in terms of secretion is, is really, really um, something that's, that's, that's still being worked on today. So, so you know, if we... Um, thought that insulin was the only thing that circulated in blood and mediated communication between tissues, we'd have at least a reasonable understanding of what's going on here, but that couldn't be further from the truth. So, you know, you can survey this in various ways, but, but um, when you look at sort of the coding genome in humans, um, there are, you know, a significant fraction that have evolved to be secreted, right? And, um, you know, the, the question that we find really interesting is, why would these proteins be circulating in the blood and what potentially could they be doing? And you can, you can assess this in several different ways, but I think the, the take home message is that we really have no idea for what the conserved functions are for a lot of these. So the approach that we generally take is asking, okay, if these proteins and these circulating factors that mediate endocrine communication are under control of natural variation, can we exploit the fact that, you know, there's everything sequencing these days coming out and we can kind of mine this to make guesses for modes of tissue communication. So, um, the, you know, the, the approach that we take is I like to start from mouse genetics, uh, even though individuals of my lab kind of, uh, you know, think that starting with human is fine. But I think, you know, I have kind of a plug side on why we, you would use mouse genetics. Um, well, you know, I think you can make really educated guesses for what the genetics are doing because the environment's restricted and this penetrance, things like heritability estimates are so much higher. Um, mice don't lie as much when they're asked questions and you can take the traits out. You know, it's not like something, you can take the tissues and traits and it's not like a tissue has been sitting on a surgery table for 12 hours and then RNA sequenced. And there are so many mouse, you know, I work on one specifically, this HMDP, but there are a lot of different mouse population resources available now. And they're, they're really carefully assessed in terms of different physiology and tissues. And it, it's, it's kind of beautiful. And ultimately, we can take these data and we can exploit the fact that, you know, people have been generating knockouts or overexpression models for quite some time to make educated guesses. So the approach that we like to take is we start with genetic variation in mice and we look at what's obvious from these, you know, correlation or network structures. And then we move into humans and ask what conserved. It doesn't have to happen this way, but this is sort of the way that we think is, is, is reasonable and, and more accurate. So, you know, I told you that the big, 
you know, our goal here is to sort of find new endocrine modes of crosstalk by just surveying genetic variation. And so I'm gonna give this example of leptin, right? Discovered in 1950 um, in Jackson lab and, and you know, cloned in the 90s. And, and so we, we know that leptin um, is an adipokine that is secreted in response to food, right? And it signals to the hypothalamus um, satiety. So, you know, this, this protein is secreted, it tells the brain to stop eating. So when there's a mutation in leptin, the, the mice just keeps eating and the end result is as such. So we know what leptin does, right? We know where leptin operates and where it signals, um, you know, at least some aspects of it. So the, the intuition that I want to sort of drive home here is that we can understand and pick up this mode of communication by just looking at genetic diversity. So here I have a, you know, this is a hypothetical but real example of five strains of mice, right? I mean, this is like your C57 black 6, 129, uh, DBA, and all these others. And so if you think about it, right, there are genetics that differ between these individuals. So at this stage, we don't necessarily know what the SNPs are, although we can find out. But we know that genetic variation drives expression of leptin in fat. Right? So this mouse has low leptin, moderate, higher, higher, and this mouse has high levels of leptin. And I, we know what leptin does. I told you what leptin does. And so you might assume that because genetics is driving the levels of leptin in these tissues, you can, in some examples, pick up this mode of signaling by just looking across at what pathways are engaged, right? So if you have high levels of leptin, right, then you're going to have high suppression of these satiety signals and high and so this is, you know, I mean, this is correlation, right? This is, this is levels of one tissue predict levels in another tissue. And so what this really looks like when we expand this out now, you know, it's a few hundred mice, around 100 strains, um, is, is we, we look a lot at these kind of histograms right here. Um, and so what this is plotting are individual fat genes, right? This is their bin frequency. And this is their strength of correlation with all genes in hypothalamus. Okay, so on the left-hand side, these are really weakly correlated genes between the tissues, right? This is the average level of correlation between the two tissues. And, you know, you can see it forms this very nice Gaussian distribution, right? But what we find really more compelling than the fact that you can reproduce normal distributions from biology is that when we do this, there's always this skew up and to the right. And if you see that, right, there's not very many genes in this example, but what these are, are genes that are exerting stronger than by chance, right, correlation from adipose tissue to hypothalamus. So if you think about this, this sort of intuition that genetics drives these levels, and we know that this signaling mechanism is real, right, we know what leptin does and how it acts on hypothalamus, um, you might assume that this is where, in this strong you know, pattern of concordance, you would pick these up. And you know, surely enough, this is exactly where we pick up leptin, right? It sits right here as one of the strongest correlated genes from adipose to hypothalamus. So following this, this observation, you know, the first thing we sort of did is, beyond this end of one example of leptin, can we find other ways that we know tissues communicate by surveying? So we took you know, this, this five tissues right here, and we sort of asked, okay, well, so leptin signals from fat, hypothalamus, right? Do we see other things? Well, we do see things like ghrelin going from, you know, uh, from, from uh, intestine to hypothalamus. We see uh, adiponectin signaling to liver, right? And when we take a step back, actually roughly half, right, 42% of all of these top-ranked endocrine sort of circuits that I showed in that distribution are known. Right? That means that someone's knocked them out and these target tissues have been affected or someone's used a recombinant protein to show that there's action. So, so this is for us really great proof of principle that we're on the right track, right? Just looking at simple linear correlation across tissues can pick up half, um, you know, half of these are known potent endocrine hormones. But what's equally exciting to us is the fact that half of these are unknown, right? So these are strongly concordant genes across tissues, but we have no idea what they do or what they are. So, so we sort of, you know, develop this, this generalized approach. You look 
okay, what's strongly concordant between these tissues? You integrate pathway enrichment to act, you know, what, what processes these potentially engaging. And, you know, it's not that hard, right? These generate a hypothesis and you can screen these using either recombinant protein in cells, administering to mice or viral overexpression. So, you know, I just want to highlight some um, ways that we sort of have, have been doing this. So, so, you know, in this, in this example, there is adipose tissue signaling the skeletal muscle. And we can see, you know, I mean, these are very well-known hippokines right here, but there's these other genes like this one, lipocalin 5, that as I mentioned, is strongly correlated between tissues, but we really don't understand what, what it's doing. And so, you know, this, this gene um, is, is significantly enriched and things related to mitochondrial biogenesis, specifically positively enriched. And so we have this hypothesis, right? Our hypothesis is that adipose produces lipocalin-5 and this engages mitochondrial signaling in skeletal muscle. And so we test the hypothesis, right? You, you purify the recombinant protein. In this case, we're, we're pouring it on C2, C12 differentiated myotubes and monitoring oxygen consumption over time. I think, you know, in uh, the context of an IDDK, a lot of us are familiar with, uh, you know, looking at seahorse assays. So, but the take home message is that when the recombinant protein alone is treated on these myotubes, there's more respiration coming from these cells. So, you know, this, this is, I think, experimental validation that this gene is engaging skeletal muscle pathways. We also generated a viral overexpressor for this using an adenovirus. These are very high levels of overexpression, just to be upfront about it. But when we do overexpress this after two weeks in a high fat diet, we observe that this overexpression of lipocalin 5 is sufficient to improve right glucose metabolism profiles. So there's less integral for this area under the curve. And as a consequence, right, you're more responsive to this bolus of glucose. Um, and so this is what I was talking about. So we got very excited about lipocalin 5. And we asked, okay, what's the human lipocalin-5? And surely enough, there's no human lipocalin-5, um, or at least not annotated. But this is what I was talking about, where now you know, we can go with um, human data sets where we have matched similar sort of uh, sample sizes, right? This is a beautiful data set generated by Johan Bjorkegren, um, where you have various tissues and, and across a few hundred individuals and their RNA sequenced genotype. So we just looked, okay, if there is adipose tissue enrichment in the mice going the skeletal muscle, is there another gene that, um, that, that exerts just as striking concordance with respect to mitochondrial genes in muscle? And you know, I, I'm not going to show all of there are a lot, but I'm not going to show all of them. The one that stood out to us was this gene lipocalin 6, right? So now you know, we use this sort of cross-tissue uh, correlation to prioritize what the human ortholog is for this lipocalin. And, you know, surely enough, um, at least in vitro, right, this lipocalin-6 was sufficient to enhance the same respiratory pathways in muscle. So I think, you know, this is a, a good end of one proof of principle for the fact that we can look across tissues and find new factors, right? And, and so, you know, I, I want to give you some examples of, of other proteins that we're quite excited about that we found this. Um, you know, to be upfront, this doesn't always work. Correlation is not causality. So you can never get around experiments. But we think that, you know, even finding some of these new modes of tissue crosstalk is quite exciting. So I mentioned lipocalin 5 using this approach was strongly correlated with muscle mitochondrial genes. Another um, inner tissue circuit that we came across was that we observed liver nodum expression was sufficient to enhance adipose thermogenic machinery, right? Um, so we, we, you know, this hypothesis again came from the same approach. And then when we overexpress nodum, this was sufficient to increase things like UCP1 and subcutaneous and the, the thermogenic capacity of the mice. And we can apply this sort of uh, generalized approach to other data sets too, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be uh, RNA sequencing is which I showed before. So in this case, we applied, right? We asked what intestinal genes are strongly concordant with the abundance of microbiota composition. And we think that, you know, we've come across this gene, Adam Deck one that through serious experimentation, we believe this is sort of a uh, sensor of different microbiota that sort of drives um, autocrine or paracrine signaling in the intestine. So just to sort of summarize this part, 
right? I, I hope that I'm convincing you that these correlations can be used to identify, you know, I'm gonna speed up a little bit, some new modes of inner tissue signaling. But, you know, the disadvantage of, my, of this sort of um, approach is that, you know, we're kind of ping-ponging across tissues, right? So we're just looking one tissue, one tissue, one tissue, one tissue, right? And, and you know, when, at least when I think about endocrinology, I don't at all think that that's the way it operates, right? In fact, I would make the argument that there are very few examples where one cell type in one tissue would produce something to exclusively signal to one cell type in another tissue. So the way that 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 I think we can sort of um, get around these constraints, and you know, this is the, the, this is really sort of what uh, the pilot program for this this project is enabling, is integrating various network modeling. Right. And so, so, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about how these networks are constructed. Um, you know, I, I mean, it would be easy to provide more details, but in this case, this is what we do, right? We take the same, you know, we take mice, right? Again, it's genetic variation, so around 100 strains of mice. We take five tissues, in this case, right? Bone, heart, liver, aorta, adipose. And what we do is we say, okay, where are these genes correlated? Right? Are they more correlated strongly between or within tissues? And also with this context, do we pick up evidence of active communication, right? So here we can see, okay, yes, there are examples where like this bone module right here could probably care less about the rest of the network and is not interacting at all, and that's fine. But you know, for the most part, there is really active communication, right? I mean, there's strong connectivity between these modules, even some where there's shared tissues that are within this context. And when we include things like traits, right, like the, the levels of insulin and body weight and fat mass percentage, right, these also sit in the areas where we observe these communication between tissues. So I think, you know, the take home message that this network view really enables us to get, a, you know, a, a more sort of, I guess, physiologic reflection of what's going on. And so we can evaluate this network in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to provide you with an example of one way that we're interrogating this. And in this case, what we do is we take all of these modules, right, all of these groups of genes that we observe, and we ask which one is the most central of the network, right? So if you pull these out individually, which one disrupts this overall network structure the most? And it is this, this, this guy right here, um, this, this module arbitrarily named module four, which is mostly adipose tissue genes, almost exclusively, with the exception of a few vascular genes. And we did the same exact thing. So now that we have this module that we think is really important in the context of the network, right, what's inside this module? So we, we you know, this module looks like this. It's very hairy, very messy. And we asked, all right, what are some potential drivers of this whole model? And so, you know, not surprisingly, we observed our favorite uh, protein from before, leptin, you know, some other very well-described, um, you know, metabolic messengers really in this. But we also observe this gene, ITIH5, which I'll talk about a little bit more, as among the most central um, genes within the context of this central network, right? So we got interested in this because it's sort of, you know, exerting the centrality. And this gene, ITIH5, is expressed exclusively by adipose tissue in mice and humans. And it's within the context of adipose tissue, and there's around 80 individuals um, where, where adipose tissue has been fractionated in RNA-seq, within the context of adipose tissue, it's expressed almost exclusively, really exclusively, by mature adipocytes, right? So this gene within this central fat network, right, is really coming from the mature adipocytes. And, you know, we also got interested because when we sort of integrate, you know, things that we think are relevant in this network, like why is it so connected with fat mass and insulin, right? ITIH5 is as well. So it, it's interesting, in humans, it's positively concordant with HOMO-IR um, and fat mass percentage, at least in this population of humans, although it's been re replicated in Starnet. Um, and in mice, in this chow HMDP, when mice are you know, more normal, fed a chow diet, it's also positively correlated with these traits. But interesting, when we feed mice, you know, when these same population of mice are fed a high fat diet, this shifts, right? The same genetic backgrounds, just given a high fat diet, now this gene is becoming negatively correlated with, with um, you know, a homo IR as well as fat mass and many other traits. And so we, you know, we think that this is a gene by diet interaction and that will become relevant in a second, but, but you know, it's, it's sort of just something to consider right now. 
So we sort of did the obvious thing, right? What's known about ITH5? Well, it belongs to this huge family of you know, nonspecific protease inhibitors. Um, the only study in the context of metabolisms measured this protein, but it is induced pretty robustly in a high fat diet. Um, it, it operates independently of its, its ability to inhibit proteases, and it's also found covalently linked to um, bicunin and regulates ECM remodeling in skin. And I don't want to get into this because I, I think some of these studies are, are a little, well, I don't want to say superficial, but, but you know, I'm um, at least lacking some power. But it, it also has been implicated as sort of, a, you know, a, a modestly as a biomarker of different sort of traits. But, but we, we came interested in it, as I told you, because we're really focused on mining these new proteins and not a whole lot's known about this. Um, you know, I might, in the interest of time, I apologize, I might skip through some of this. It's just a little bit of sort of, you know, regression modeling. And we think that not surprisingly, this gene is correlated with like BMI and fat mass and insulin resistance. And so we think that this sort of explains some of the variance about these traits. I'll skip through this. So, so you know, we, we have this hypothesis, right? This gene is coming from adipose tissue, and it seems to be relevant for, for um, signaling between tissues, module connectivity. So we asked, right, what's going on? Where is it signaling? What is it doing? So the first thing we did is we got some recombinant protein, injected it in a mice, and we already sequenced some of the tissues that we thought might be correlated with with this gene, just to look where is this acting, right? So we injected the protein, we had RNA sequence, and we look at how much genes change in response to this protein as a metric for where is it acting. And in this case, in this, you know, in this, in this normal setting, this, this protein seemed to be somewhat specific for adipose tissue. It does engage other uh, tissues as well, but most genes are changing in adipose tissue specifically. And this is sort of uh, what it did is in adipose tissue sort of upregulated things related to Wnt signaling and downregulated things related to, to immune system function, like, um, well, at least humoral immune system function, like, like um, immune cell infiltration. So, so we, we sort of, you know, have this working hypothesis that ITIH5 predominantly acts in an autocrine or paracrine fashion in adipose tissue to exert its effects. And this seems conserved in humans when we take, G, you know, GTEx, which is uh, around 30-some tissues, and we ask, okay, where, in what tissues is this also sort of concordant with? Um, you know, if we look at the, the visceral tissue, it's sort of enriched for visceral tissues. And we look at ITH5 and subcutaneous, it's sort of obviously enriched in subcutaneous tissue. So this just sort of suggests that, that this, this autocrine paracrine signaling is conserved, right? One interesting thing is that when we repeated this exact same experiment that I showed you here, except following a high fat diet, the diet basically completely prevented the protein's ability to engage gene expression in fat. So what we think is going on is that the high fat, you know, this, this, this is meeting these paracrine signaling pathways, but high fat diet really you know, part of the pathophysiology of high fat diet is to sort of prevent ITIH5 from, from engaging these, these, these pathways, these wind and immune system pathways. So we did, you know, the next thing we wanted to do is evaluate what is sort of the, the, the long-term consequences of modifying ITIH5. So what we did is we made an adeno-associated viral vector. We overexpress, you know, overexpressing ITIH5 coming from fat cells specifically. This is an adiponectin promoter. Um, it's selectively also degraded in the liver. This leads to about a six to seven fold upregulation of gene expression in fat. And we did a lot of, you know, we sort of do it. I, I, well, I was trained in endocrine metabolism and you kind of, you know, throw it out a battery of metabolic assays, right? So the first thing that we did was a glucose tolerance test. And what we observed here I think is interesting because it perfectly recapitulates this gene by diet interaction. So here, this is normal chow mice, right? Administered glucose. You can see it's got this nice glucose disposal curve. These are mice overexpressing ITIH5. So it, it essentially makes things worse, right? It makes things um, you know, less sensitive to this glucose bolus. However, under high fat diet, it's exactly the opposite. These are our high fat GFP expressors right here. Not surprising, um, you know, the, the area under the curve is a lot um, greater than the chow, but ITH5 completely 
right, um, flips in terms of its mode of action. It is now sensitizing, right, the system to a bolus of glucose. And so, you know, I, I mean, I, I can show you a lot of things. We, we did a lot of gene expression. At first, I thought this was coming from muscle um, and signaling, but it seems to be coming a lot from fat. And so what, um, what we did is we looked in fat at what's going on. And, you know, I'm just showing some representative examples, but we do think that this captures sort of the, the overall physiology. So we have chow GFP mice, where you can see this is a nice normal section of fat in terms of neutrophil elastase, macrophage stain, right, um, fibrosis. And then uh, in ITH5, there are some subtle effects. I'm not going to talk about these here, but you know, we can talk later if you want. Um, and then high fat diet, it makes things worse, right? I mean, there's more neutrophil elastase. You get these crown-like structures and macrophages, a lot of, you know, uh, they're embedded in the ECM. And then there's a lot of fibrosis. But this high fat ITH5, right, basically makes this fat, in my opinion, look more like the chow mice than it does the high fat diet. So, you know, this, this sort of um, recapitulates the GFP. So I was, almost 100% certain that this would change the mass of the fat, right? Just looking at this histology and the GTT. And, you know, as, as is the case in science, I was completely wrong. And so this sort of, you know, gross morphologic change and this change in, in sort of systemic glucose metabolism had absolutely zero effect on the body composition itself. So even though sort of the, the, the histological parameter of fat is really, really altered, um, you know, the amount of fat and the amount of lean mass that we measure in the mice is actually still the same. And I'll, you know, I'll sort of circle back to this a little bit more. So we were really curious about this. What is going on in fat that really is, is mediating the systemic metabolic effects? And so we did some metabolic cage assays here. And, um, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of data that we sort of go through. But, but the take home message is that, you know, you can see that, that the energy expenditure profile, this is, you know, Chow GFP, Chow ITH5, high fat diet, and then ITH5 high fat diet. The, the, the energy expenditure looks very similar to the Chow profiles, right? So again, just like GTT, it's sort of rescuing this, this effect. But interesting, when you look at energy expenditure with respect to the proportion of lean mass and fat mass, within these groups. So this is a within group regression. In all of the other groups, with the exception of ITIH5, right, lean mass basically predicts the energy expenditure itself. However, in fat mass, if you look at this, right, the higher the fat mass, right, the higher, in this case, the energy expenditure. And, you know, I mean, lean mass sort of is the same thing, right? Lean mass, conversely, sorry, this is going down in terms of lean mass, right? Um, and, and as a consequence, energy expenditure, and it's exactly the opposite. So we think, you know, I mean, the take home message is we think that, you know, this is sort of making fat, I guess, more efficient in, in an energetic context. So uh, another thing that we observed, and this is, this is something that stuck with us for quite a while, is when we apply this very simple linear model, this linear approach that I mentioned before, ITH5 is also one of the most strongly correlated genes with ART. Specifically, it's negatively correlated with um, uh, like FOXO signaling, AMPK, and, and you know, the, the mass of the heart itself. And so, um, you know, we, we, we also measured sort of echocardiographic traits in this context. Um, for purposes that, that, you know, I won't get into in the context of time, we think that these effects are, are, are indirect. We think that these are due to the impact on glucose metabolism and fat homeostasis. But nonetheless, you know, again, it's, a, it's this sort of gene by diet interaction, right? The, the mass of the left ventricle is reduced in the context of ITH5 under normal chow conditions, right? And this is completely desensitized under a high fat diet. In fact, the only thing, and we can't explain this at all, but in fact, the only thing that does change in the high fat diet group mice is the rate of the heart. So potentially some compensatory effects. Um, so, you know, we really think that this is, this is sort of something that's operating, you know, I mean, it's changing systemic metabolism, which I think is our real interest and primary focus right now, but it's interesting to sort of, you know, recapitulate these, these levels of the, the level of heart as well. So, you know, our, our working model here is that we have genetic variation, right? I mean, other factors that we're investigating too, and diet that drives expression of ITH5 in mature adipocytes. This is mediating some autocrine signaling in fat. And I, you know, I, I, 
I would love to have like a six hour discussion on the the, the mechanisms that we're, we're, we're testing right now. Um, and we think, you know, we have reasonable evidence that it's altering, you know, sort of the, the extracellular matrix and as a consequence, how fat maintains vascular integrity. And this in turn is what drives sort of these local immune system functions and, you know, systemic effects, right? It's making this fat kind of more energy efficient. And this is leading to sort of changes in, in um, you know, at least systemic glucose metabolism and other consequences as well. So you know, this is just an example of what we're, 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 we're doing. But, you know, what I really want to highlight is that using this sort of network construction approach, right, this is another way that we're viewing endocrinology. And I think this is an exciting way. It's a little bit more difficult, right, to sort of disentangle direct communication. But, you know, it is sort of um, a really, really nice way, I think, to, to view in parallel with these correlations. And so this network construction gives us another view, right? This ITH5 protein um, really we think is a, a key driver of fat homeostasis. And this has a lot of effects, which are sort of gene by diet types of interactions. So, um, you know, what I really hope that, that I've convinced you, if nothing else, right, is that, you know, there is a rationale for bridging, right, population genetics with endocrinology. And, you know, we can, we can basically throw any, I mean, I, you know, I'm not happy that everything ends in omics these days, but, um, you know, we can really throw a lot of different data types at this, and we're working on, you know, other ways to sort of integrate, um, you know, not just things like proteomics or RNA-seq, but also, uh, you know, single cell and, and metabolomics and others. Um, and, and so, you know, we really can, can come across new ways that these are, are, are signaling. And so, you know, what, what, where are we going with this, right? So, I mean, there's a, the, the, the opportunity that this, this pilot project really gives us is to take an unbiased approach to surveying endocrinology using natural variation. So one thing we're doing is, is we're building Bayesian network. I mean, the Bayesian network is actually what I showed before, but, but you know, we're, we're evaluating all of these different network construction methods uh, systematically, and we're doing the first thing that I showed earlier, right? Where do we observe an overrepresentation of known endocrine circuits? And um, what else is there, right? Um, so, so we're doing different, you know, we think, I, I can talk about a little bit more, but we think, um, in this, right, ICA decomposition offers a really good way. Also convolutional neural necks and some others. Um, one thing that we hope, you know, if, if reviewer two um, ever gets in a good mood, I hope that, you know, we can have our web portal published and up and running very soon. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing that I think is really quite exciting, to be honest, is, you know, I was trained just in endocrine physiology is, uh, at, well, at least as the computation people, is like, time to get wet, they say in my lab is, you know, I mean, really just dive into some of these, these like ITH5 and, and lipokalin and, and, and these genes and really, you know, ask the important questions like, how and why would adipose tissue really conserve a way to modify its you know, sort of immune and vascular homeostasis, and why would diet be such a critical regulator of this? You know, I mean, I think um, this is really a guide for experimentation that we're excited about, right? And so with that being said, um, you know, the most important slide, right, is the people. So, um, you know, starting a lab right now hasn't been uh, exactly as <laughs> uh, most of us anticipated, but you know, it's been fun and I've been lucky to have some really, you know, good people join our group. Um, in particular, Leandro um, and Casey have really just spearheaded this ITIH5 project and done other things. We have some really talented um, undergrads and some, you know, uh, computational students, PhD students as well, who are doing this. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I put this just to sort of summarize, you know, I think what we find most compelling um, is, you know, we're not on the tail end of, uh, Maggie is, but, you know, we're not on the tail end of sort of, you know, developing uh, new computational methods almost every day, you know, nor are we exactly focused on the underlying physiology of, of just one of these proteins, although, you know, it does look interesting and tempting to do so. But where we're really excited about is sort of sitting halfway in between. And I think, you know, um, one fun thing that I've experienced in my training is that, you know, just getting computational people to talk to wet lab people and vice versa is really critical, right? I mean, having, you know, people that know the biology really evaluating these bioinformatics methods and conversely, right? I mean, people that as, you know, we're, we're 
grinding late hours at the bench and you come across an exciting observation, right? Just not being um, hesitant to uh, use like computational methods to, to help, uh, you know, confirm or deny hypotheses. And so, you know, also people at UC Irvine who have really helped me um, get set up and going, even though my lab hasn't always been to, even been together once, but um, specifically Paolo, who played a big role in recruiting me and getting me set up. And um, yeah, I don't know if people know, know Paolo or knew Paolo, but um, I had a very short time with him, but he just an absolutely was an absolutely wonderful person and um, really a, an idol as a scientist. Uh, and Selma and Cholsun, who have really been, you know, they're, they're also relatively new faculty UCI helping out. Um, also, you know, I think mentorship can be just as important as the science itself. And so I've been really lucky to have like met Jake in particular as my postdoc mentor, but a wonderful group of people at UCLA, as well as elsewhere um, during my postdoc training and now that, that guide a lot of this. Um, also, you know, for keeping the lights on in lab, which is none of this can happen without, to the DK pilot net program, of course, and to, you know, our sort of career transition funding um, for getting this lab up and running. And so with that being said, you know, I can definitely take any questions um, if, if people have them. Uh, Marcus, there's one question uh, from yes. Chenji in the chat. Um, yeah. For IDIH5 experiment, how do you decide the time of treatment for RNA seq? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, why two hours, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so the honest answer is it's very arbitrary. <laughs> um, but but you know, we we wanted two hours because you know, we felt that this is sort of a minimum time point where mRNAs are changing, right? So, you know, I mean, the balance of upregulation versus decay. Um, but, but, at, but we chose that minimum time point just because we wanted to see very direct effects. Um, you know, our concern is if we waited to like six hours or eight hours that, yeah, we would see a lot of changes across tissue. But like, let's say that this causes you know, this ECM sort of effect in adipose tissue, let's say that this causes release of other proteins or, you know, um, metabolic, you know, I mean, metabolites, right? Then we might see greater signaling in the context of like muscle or something um, because of that. So, so, you know, we, in this case, I think doing RNA-seq after a longer time point would make a lot, would make a lot of sense for gauging, you know, bridging the ITH5 observations. But in this case, we really just wanted to see what are the direct effects. I, I, I hope that answers the question sufficiently. Yes, no, that's okay. Yeah, you know, I can't see the chat, which is... Uh, so it's it's, it's right. me, Marcus. Hi, it's Tom. Tom, hi! Hey, how are you? Oh, good, good. Nice to see your stuff all coming together. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, thrilled to see that you're, uh, you're settling in well. So I, I was wondering if it looked to me like there was a lot of opportunity for you to refine some of your, um, like some of your, the phenotypes that you have with ITH5. I was particularly curious, have you thought about not doing the validation just in black six, but maybe even picking like from your gene expression network, can you find a strain that is most responsive to it and do some of the validation experiments in those strains? Oh. And I also wondered if you'd looked like your adipose, uh, your adiposity data suggested that it's not really changing, right? Although like your histology did, but I wonder if you looked earlier because it could be that, you know, you, as you know, from the HMDP high fat data, the, the biggest change in adiposity is in the first two weeks and then it kind of stabilizes, right? So if you do a shorter term experiment, would you find room for, uh, for, some, uh, for some changes there? Yeah, um, you know, those are two great questions. Um, so, you know, the, the first question, I guess, maybe is, is like, should, you know, should we try this in another strain? And I think 100%, yes, we should try this in, you know, multiple strains. Um, and I think that as you, as you've done, Tom, right? Um, but, but I think, uh, you know, for us, honestly, I just in starting a new lab, you know, it's sort of a resource and, and reagent question. You know, we're doing it across sexes right now. But um, I think that for a lot of these, I'm personally switching a lot to DBA. And DBA, right, are, you know, the, the strain DBA2G, but DBA are, I think, honestly, more human in terms of their insulin resistant profile. Um, and, and so I, we have mice, we're waiting to get the virus to try and DBA, and I'm really excited. I mean, I think you're exactly right. You know, we think, 
I, I don't think ITH5 alone contributes to the DBA difference, obviously, right? But I think seeing these effects in the context of genetic diversity would help us rule out, is it particular to one genetic background or not, right? Um, so, so I think it's a great point, great question, and we're, we're trying it, but I have no data for you. Um, the second one is the adiposity question. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was really surprised by that data as well. Because, um, you know, also one thing I didn't point out is we, we give this AAV from the beginning and it's always overexpressed. And so they do, you know, experience that two week in plateau. We, we did look at adiposity, uh, I think, a week and a half after the, the viral administration and diet. Um, you know, there wasn't a change there, but I'm not sure because in that case, at least for this study, it didn't seem to change, you know, the overall fat mass proportion after a high fat diet. And again, this could go back to the fact that it's in black six, right? Um, as opposed to others. So, you know, it is a really curious observation and I'm not sure, you know, one thing that Casey and we've been sort of talking about is, you know, I mean, is it really a fat mass thing? Or, you know, if you have, as we showed, right? I mean, if you have, Where's the histology? Um, gosh, this is so, so, you know, maybe if you just have more fibrosis and immune cells and all of that, it does change the, the mass of the fat, right? The, the adipose tissue mass as well, but we're not seeing the actual proportion of lipid. You know, I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, you know, this is how we're thinking about it. But, you know, I, I would have expected really large changes in fat mass. So we're not entirely sure why yet, but this is, you know, this has been twice we've done the ITH5 ABs and both times there's just no obvious change. <laughs> that okay that's cool sorry let me just give you a real quick heads up because you as you probably expect giving aav to different strains is not all that straightforward so just bear that in mind when you do your experiments in dba we're having a bit of trouble with that right now but you know feel free to reach out but really good i will i will thank you <laughs> yeah that is good to know Okay, there is another question in the chat uh, from yes. Ron. So really good work. Many of the tissues you study have important circadian overlays to control. Have you been able to factor time of day into your analysis? Oh man, I, yeah, that is a really, okay. So, you know, you guys are all asking good questions. Um, you know, so, so I, when I joined here, right, Paolo, who I mentioned in Selma, are exclusively circadian people, and they have been pounding this into the wall. Um, you know, for these animals, at least in these studies, all of the strains were sacrificed at the same time of day within a two-hour period, right? So, so at least there at the time of the day. But I think that this question is really critical because um, you know, we have some some work that we're doing with Selma and 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 you know uh, postdocs from Palo's lab, where there even in this when we restrict the time of day, there is obvious sort of communication between clocks and different tissues, which is I think a really exciting and different area. Um, and and so what that means is that just when you restrict the time of day, genetics right is mediating some of this clock function, right? Some of this clock concordance between tissues. So, um, you know, in this case, we haven't explicitly modeled like what, you know, hour it was or anything like that. I think this is going to be critical for anyone designing any mouse study, because if you do it at different times a day, I mean, you're going to probably look mostly at circadian rhythm. But I think, you know, even in this, there's going to be very obvious gene by circadian interactions. And so the reason that I think that's really relevant is perhaps the same time of day for one genetic factor is not the same time of day. You, you see what I mean, circadian time point for another genetic background. And yeah, I, I think, I, I have no idea how to systematically assess this, but I think it's a really interesting concept. And I, I think even just looking at genetic variation, we pick up obvious remnants of, of sort of clocks driving different things. Um, you know, I, I, I don't realize I didn't answer that question specifically, but I, I think that's just my, my feeling on, on integrating circadian rhythms with these data. Thank you.